Good morning, and God bless you. It is a joy to be together today, and it will be a clearer joy if I can turn my mic on. <laughs> it is good to be together today where it is warm and comfortable and dry as we look outside at the torrential downpour at the moment. And uh, we welcome you to worship today. If you are here in person, if you are watching our live stream, or if you watch our service later on in the week, we welcome you to worship with us, and we hope you will find joy in this hour. Our call to worship this month is from, uh, is alluding to the Psalms. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the people. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. He is the Lord, our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He remembers his covenant forever. The word that he commanded for a thousand generations. Praise the Lord. Would you join me in praise and prayer to the Lord? Loving God, we thank you for drawing us together this morning, wherever we are, as we watch, as we listen, as we sing, we ask that you will be with us, that you will join our hearts together, and that your Holy Spirit would encourage us this morning to learn from your word, to understand what our Lord Jesus did with his life that helps our life, and know that as we leave today, we are better equipped for the week ahead. We ask your blessings on our time together, even as we together, we pray the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I would invite you to sing with us, count your blessings, and the words are in our bulletin this morning.
Our scripture reading uh, is listed in the bulletin, and I will get to that uh, at the end of the service, or at the end of the sermon. But uh, to begin with, I have a few other scriptures uh, that I'm going to read a verse from here and a, a verse from there. And uh, the topic this morning is about being thankful. And sometimes we think about ourselves and what our reputation is. And we wonder what people think about us. But as Christians, as people who believe in God, we have to be thankful for something. Grateful, thankful, thankfulness, those words all go together. And I don't mean that you have to be thankful for something. I mean you have to be thankful for something. In other words, it's not okay to not be thankful. Romans 12:18 tells us if it is possible as if it is possible as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And those are good guiding words as we start to think about being thankful because we want to be able to get along with people and do well in our relationships with them. And I want you to think about for a moment what I want to call the curmudgeon effect. You know, the word curmudgeon that means, well, like Mr. Wilson and Dennis the Menace, he's a curmudgeon. Like people that we call bad guys, fault finder, that lady behind you that honks. Those are curmudgeons. Mrs. Kravitz on Bewitched. Archie Bunker. George Jefferson. Marie and Frank Barone on Everybody Loves Raymond. Sheldon Cooper on The Big Bang Theory. Jay Pritchett in Modern Family. Almost every sitcom has that bad guy, that grumpy person, woman or man, couple sometimes, couple of people, but there's that curmudgeon factor. You can always count on them to say something negative. You can always count on them to do something unexpectedly bad. And not that there aren't human moments and good moments with those curmudgeons, but in general, their reputation is not as a cheerful, loving, person. Now I would say even in the Bible we have some examples of curmudgeons. I would say Balaam is one. You may or may not remember in Numbers 22 that Balaam is the guy who had the donkey. He was supposed to be going somewhere for, the, for God, but he wasn't listening very well. God sent an angel to get in the road of Balaam. The donkey saw the angel, but Balaam didn't. You can read the story. It's fantastic because the donkey then speaks. One of only two animals in the Bible who gets to speak. And the donkey addresses Balaam and says, hey, how come you're beating me? How come you're kicking me? Don't you see that angel there? Balaam was a curmudgeon. Also, I think Herod in Matthew 2, when the wise men go to see him, and he has instructed all the baby boys to be killed in the area to make sure that there would be no ruler that would grow up and be in opposition to him. He is definitely a curmudgeon. In Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira, uh, very sad tale. Uh, they uh, sold some land and placed it at the apostles' feet in the early church but they held some back secretively. And uh, the apostles say, well, that was wrong because you promised to give the whole thing and you only gave part of it and that's not truthful. So those are a couple biblical examples of curmudgeons. So people who are not known for being nice, who are not known for being generous, who are not known for being thankful, which is where we're going today. I've always considered in my life, for the most part, a couple exceptions, that I agree with Psalm 16.6 that says the boundary lines have fallen for 
be in pleasant places. And to me, the boundary lines are what we learn about God and God's commandments for us. And that we live within those boundaries, we live within those rules, and that gives us a pleasant, wonderful, earthly life. I don't know if it seems that way to you or if you want to be outside those bounds of the things that we think are loving and the way we act as Christians that is hopefully caring and service-oriented. But think, think about that. Boundary line. What makes us thankful and what puts us outside that? I was talking to a friend yesterday, well, we were texting, and uh, it was a friend who plays Pokemon too. And when you collect your little Pokemon, there's some that are really good quality Pokemon. And there's some that are just horrible, that you trade or you delete or you get rid of. And my friend was complaining about the quality of his Pokemon. He was just not satisfied. He says his luck is bad. When he catches them, they're never good. When he trades them, they're even worse. And then he said something interesting. He said, my wife says I complain about everything. And I said, well, I, I wouldn't know that. I only hear you complain about Pokemon. But isn't that interesting that he knows that about himself? That he is approaching curmudgeonism. <laughs> Maybe he needs to stop and think a little bit about why he complains and how he can change that and maybe all of us should if we think we complain more than we praise if we think we argue and bicker more than we are joyful and give thanks maybe we need to think about why am I doing that and how do I become a thankful person and I have some instructions you're in luck yeah, I have some instructions on how to become thankful. So if you feel like that's an area you could grow in, and I think we all could, if you feel like that's an area of your life that you need some work on, I want to just say that being thankful and thankfulness and thanksgiving, it doesn't just happen one day in November when we eat turkey. And it doesn't just happen a week before and a week after. We say Thanksgiving and we call it a season, but Thanksgiving is not supposed to be contained to the time after Halloween and before Advent. Thanksgiving, thankfulness, the thankful life, is something that we should be aiming for in our whole lives, all the time. A lifestyle of thankfulness if you will. There is a great verse in Luke. In fact, we call it the greatest commandment. It's in verse 27 of chapter 10 of the book of Luke. And Jesus says in answer to a question, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Isn't that interesting? The most important thing for us to do is love the Lord your God with everything you have. And that's the first step towards leading a thankful life, is living a God-centered life. Just as we don't go from baby to adult all in one moment, it takes quite a while, we have to work on going from being not so thankful to more thankful in our lives. And what's needed is a mindset, a mindset of loving God first. And you may think, well, what about my family? And what about my income? And what about my dogs? Well, yeah, all of that's important. But the very most important thing is to put God first. To have that orientation of when you make a decision to ask God first. A lot of times I'm in a situation and I think, you know, I really should have asked God about this before I got myself involved. But it's still okay to pray in the midst of the situation or at the end of the situation, wherever you find yourself. 
But if we can get our mindset oriented towards God and ask God about things and talk to God about things in prayer or in our own minds, then that orients us towards God first. And living a God-centered life is the beginning of thankfulness. Now, it is possible to live a God-centered life and still have the curmudgeon effect in your life. It is possible to understand that God should be the center of our lives, but to not really be nice. Have you ever experienced that? Someone who says they're a Christian and somebody who goes to church, but in real life, they're not very nice. They yell or they scream or you see them do things multiple times that you think, oh, it's not a good witness for us. Sometimes others don't know what's wrong, but they can see you and think, ah, they seem insincere or they're not acting very nicely or their temperament is nice and then mean and nice and then mean. It's not an even temperament. And those people can see us if we act in those ways as one of those stereotypical Christians who talks one way and acts another. That's not what we're aiming for. As a thankful person, we want to be the same through and through in our lives and have a good, even temperament and be known for sincerity and kindness and love. We want to live a God-centered life and we want to believe that we're loved by God. If we don't feel like we're loved by God, those other things that are negative can kind of squeeze in our lives. And it's true. Some folks realize they should live a life that honors God, but don't feel God's love. And that's what the Bible about is about. And that's what church is about. And that's what Christians are supposed to be about to demonstrate every way we can that God loves us. Some days we feel it more than others. There may be seasons of our life when we don't feel it at all, but God always loves us. God is always trying to get through to us, through a friend, through a relative, through something we heard on the radio, through a Facebook live stream. Somehow or other, God is trying to get through to us. And as we grow and develop as Christians and people who love God, we throw away the things that are not so good and have a revolution in our actions and our thoughts. If we really believe that God loves us, then we can begin to think about loving others better. Not being selfish, stingy, or curmudgeon -y but being loving, caring, and serving. We can look at ourselves in a new light when we know that God loves us, and that new light is God's light shining down into us. Some people define the word sin as being apart from God. What do you think? That's not a bad definition. If we're apart from God, we tend to do things that are outside of those boundaries, that aren't healthy for us, that aren't good for us, that aren't loving. But as we aim to be closer to God, then the boundary lines are more pleasant. We sin less as we get closer to God. And we're more loving to the world. So step one, love God. Step two, know that God loves us. And step three, there's only three steps, so this is a good sign. But I have to warn you that in some of Paul's letters, he gets halfway through the letter, and he says, finally. So if I say finally right now, I might only be halfway through. <laughs> step three. First, know, live a God-centered life. Second, know that we are loved by God. And third, show that love to others. And this is the part other people see for the most part. This is the part that others care about. 
for the most part. But if they learn to care about our love for them, they may want to know what's behind it, that we love God and that God loves us. And you may be thinking, well, it's fine to want to get close to God. It's fine to want to follow the example of Jesus, who is God on earth. And we have a special key here in the church. It's called the Bible. And as it turns out, you can get it at Walmart. It's not a secret after all. It's available to everyone. If you have the internet, you can call up many different versions of the Bible. The one that I read from and use the most is the New International Version. But the important thing is not which version you read. The important thing is that you open it up and read it. Or listen to it, if you'd prefer. Or watch it on the screen, if you would rather. But you have to open up the book and get some idea what Jesus did on earth so you know how to follow Jesus. And I would open up the Bible to the New Testament. It's about the back forth of the Bible, and it starts with the books of Matthew and Mark and Luke and John. And you'll know you're in the right place because it starts out with Jesus being born. That's where you want to start. And learn about his life and his ministry and how he treated people and how Jesus showed love to people. Who is Jesus? What was his example? How did he live and die? Why did God raise him from the dead? All of these things are important to learn about and know as we seek to be close to Jesus. And that leads us into a relationship when we understand that Jesus is the Savior who brings us out of sin and into the best life on earth and eternal life after. Well, living that loving life is sometimes not acting on your first impulse. That may be the best advice that I can give for this step, showing love to others. If your first impulse is no, and for many of us, it is, we might need to reconsider and say, is that really what we're supposed to be doing? What's the more loving thing? How can I make this work for God? So we have to adopt some new strategies. And not only do we need to adopt some new strategies, but we have to think, hey, I need a strategy. So here's a strategy. Here's an example of a strategy. You're at the grocery store. You've got 47 items in your cart. The guy behind you has four. Guess what your strategy of love is? You let that person go first. This is not rocket science. Well, some folks aren't going to the grocery store. Some people order them online and go and pick them up. But you can take note of the name of the person who's helping you. And when you go home and somebody calls or you get an email and they want to know, how was your experience? You can say, you know, Eileen helped me and she was really great. I'd like to give her a gold star. You can make sure that your response to the people who are helping you is loving. You can thank them, and then you can follow up. So what if you order your groceries on Amazon and they get delivered? Well, I know when I order from them, I always get emails that they want me to rate the product, rate the seller, and I never do it. But that may be as much as you can do to show love in that circumstance, but it's a strategy to respond, and most people don't. It's a strategy to be loving when most people wouldn't think of it. And that's the idea, to think about what we do, to think about our response, and to act in as loving way as we can. Boy, isn't that wind outside wild? Let's just look at that for a minute. Look at those leaves. Gosh, that is really fierce. Yeah. If you're watching on the video, Boy, it was raining, 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 and now the wind is just blowing so hard. Mm, this is the kind of day when I am glad I don't live at my neighbor's house 
when all my leaves blow over the, their yard. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's really windy. Maybe that's a loving way that you can help out is by going and blowing those neighbors' leaves out to the curb so they get picked up. That might be a strategy. I found that uh, as we go on in life and we know our neighbors, as we get to know friends better, as we understand our church family, that it's easier to show love to people the better we know them. Because we know they'll be receptive to our efforts to show love, that they'll understand that we're a kind person. And it's great to do it out in the open and places where we don't know people and show love and be kind. But it's also great to do it with our families and friends. And you may be called this Thanksgiving to find new strategies of being thankful. You may need to find new ways to show kindness. You may need to think ahead and say, you know what? My family is not going to be together for Thanksgiving, but I could go right now to the store or order them online, get Thanksgiving cards, and send one to everyone that I would normally have dinner with. You could make calls, maybe not on Thanksgiving Day, but the day before, and say, hey, I miss being with you. I love you. I just want to wish you happy Thanksgiving. Think about a strategy for this Thanksgiving. And if it looks the same as it usually does to you, if you're celebrating with the same people that you usually do, maybe it's time to have a strategy of reaching out to a neighbor, to a friend, to a church person, to see if they need a place to eat, to see if they need some food dropped off, to see what strategy of kindness and love you can use. And here's the bottom line. When you are nice to others, you feel that goodness inside. When you act in loving ways, you feel inside that you have done something loving. When you have followed Christ's commands, when you follow the examples of Jesus, then you know inside that you're doing the right thing, that you're showing love to others, and it feels good to us. And then we're thankful because we feel good. It's kind of a big circle. It all goes together. We want to live a God-centered life. We want to know that we are loved by God. And we want to show that love to others. That is how to be thankful. Three easy steps. Hopefully, some of them can fit into your life. Hopefully, some of the strategies are perking away in your head. And hopefully, you'll have a loving touch for that curmudgeon in your life. So now I'm going to read the scripture after all of this. It is from the sixth chapter of Luke. And it says, do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, to be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured unto you. Isn't that a great passage? Don't judge, don't condemn, forgive. These are all ways of being thankful, our actions to others that show love. And then we receive in our hearts the knowledge that we have done well, that we have been servants of other people, and that we have followed Jesus Christ. Will you pray with me? We thank you, God, for this wonderful scripture, and we thank you for the idea of a thankful life. We thank you for the copious amount of information about Jesus that we have in the Bible that we can read and learn from. We ask you to help us to be thankful people. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we get to sing again.
And the words are in your bulletin again. And uh, the hymn is Now We Thank, Now, Now Thank We All Our God. There we go. Now Thank We All Our God. who are not with us this morning through illness or concern about the virus for those who are not feeling well and have concerns about their health for those who are in places where they cannot leave freely and be here and for those who choose not to come we ask your blessing on all of them we ask you to help us help them to be thankful through our love through our contact through our messages and talks with them. We ask you also to help us to learn about how we can have strategies of thankfulness and think about what we do in our lives that would be blessings to others, that would make us know that we're doing the right thing. We ask you to help us to not be curmudgeons and also to help those who are feel a little better about themselves and their lives. And Lord, we ask you this morning to give a special blessing to the boxes that are up front in our church here, that are representative of the boxes we will send to Operation Christmas Child, that will go to children who do not have a Christmas celebration, that they might know the love of Jesus through the toys and the crayons that we send on them. We ask a blessing on that whole operation, the folks who volunteer and the folks who drive the trucks and the folks that get to pass the boxes out to children who will love them. We ask this blessing on those boxes. We ask this blessing on our lives, that we would feel your love, that we would be able to put you first, and that you would always be part of our lives. And all of this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you are invited. You're invited to try out those three steps. Put God first and um, put God first. See ourselves as loved by God. I wanted to get that wording right. See ourselves as loved by God and show that love to others. Whether you're here today, whether you're at home, whether you watch it later in the week, we want to know that you're part of our church family today. We want to know that you're, we want you to know that you're always welcome to be here and that we will do this every Sunday. Worship the Lord. Our benediction this morning comes from the book of Jude. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence, without fault and with great joy to the only god our savior be glory majesty power and authority 
through Jesus Christ our Lord, before all ages, now, and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.